So today we have Dr. Ruben, you know, who has been in practice, you know, for more than 16 years, you know, a very experienced doctor, you know, whom, and he has just recently joined private practice. And, you know, he specializes, you know, a lot in shoulder, elbow, and also dealing with like, you know, trauma cases, you know, or trauma fractures, you know. Okay, so without further ado, you know, let me hand over the baton, you know, to Dr. Ruben, you know, to share with you over the next 30 minutes. Hi, thanks. Thanks, Desmond. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, thank you to all of you for joining us this uh, Friday afternoon. Uh, my name is, as Desmond mentioned, is uh, Ruben Manohara, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon by training. And I specialize in shoulder and elbow conditions, as well as uh, general trauma uh, and injuries. Uh, to, uh, to the bones in the body. Okay, so the topic my talk today is what shoulder pain keeping you from? Okay, so I'm part of the shoulder and elbow orthopedic group. There are three of us here. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Bernard Lee on the left and uh, Dr. Roland Chong on the right. And uh, we tend to uh, specialize in shoulder and elbow conditions. Uh, you know, our mission is to help you find the root cause of your, sh uh, your shoulder and elbow joint pains. And we want to get you back to a uh, fighting fit and uh, function and your health. Okay. So what am I going to be talking about today? Well, I'm going to talk about uh, the little bit of the shoulder anatomy and the function of your shoulder. And then I'll also discuss some of the common shoulder problems that can affect you. Uh, the conditions for the young, the middle age, as well as the elderly as well. And then I guess more importantly, what you guys really want to know is how can I protect my shoulder from injury? And finally, we'll go to have a summary, and then uh, there's still time, we'll have a question and answer session. Okay, so first off, shoulder ailments are not just limited to the very active or to the very elderly, you know. They do not discriminate young and old, male and female, active and noir, everybody can get shoulder problems. And, you know, you get, you, you read a lot of terms on the internet, or you get your friends telling you all these conditions and you come in saying, oh, do I have an instability? Do I have a labrum tear? Is there impingement? Is there a rotator cuff? Tendinitis, is it a tear? Is it a frozen shoulder? Patients come in and they ask, you know, is it this, is it that? But it's actually far from the truth. Um, so the whole point of this talk is uh, I teach you a little bit about all the conditions so you can better understand your conditions and uh, the, the treatment options available to you. So first, let's learn a bit about the shoulder anatomy and function, okay? Now your shoulder joint is the most mobile joint in the whole body. You can move it forward, you can move it backward, you can swing it in, out, and you can even rotate your arm in and out. And you can position your hand anywhere in space through a combination of the six motions. And uh, it's, a, it's the only joint in your body that can do that. But you know, together with this motion, there is that risk of instability as well. You know, you need it for your everyday daily activities. Both men and women need it. You know, for uh, uh, shampooing your hair, for combing and styling your hair, for getting dressed for women, it's very important. You know, reaching the bra behind your back for guys getting into your t-shirts. And both men and women need it for uh, toileting when the toilet seat. Hopefully, you're not using. Uh, using it the way this guy is. And of course, uh, sleeping on your shoulder. A lot of people take this for granted. Being able to have a good night's sleep and lying on your shoulder, it's very important. Then comes to your sports and your hobbies and all your recreational activities. Obviously, you know, with golf, with racket sports, with swimming, with gymming, and with contact sports, the shoulder plays a very important part. Even with cycling, because you're always with your arms outstretched and you feel the vibrations going through your arm, or with what people mistake as uh, not so uh, more sedentary like yoga or pilates, there's actually a lot of force that goes through and stress that goes through your shoulder. So it's really important that your joint is in tip-top condition for you to enjoy all these uh, sports and hobbies. So let's learn a bit about the anatomy, okay? First, you've got the bones and the joints, okay? So there are three bones that make up the shoulder joints, okay? You've got your clavicle, which is the collarbone. You've got the scapula, which is also known as the shoulder blade. And finally, you've got the humerus, which is the arm, okay? So these three bones come together and form the joints, okay? So there is this acromioclavicular joint or the AC joint, which is at the top near your collarbone. And the real shoulder joint, the main shoulder joint is where the ball or the humerus 
meets the socket of the scapula. So these are the bones and the joints that make up your shoulder. Okay? The next level are the muscles, and the muscles connect to the bones by tendons. Okay? So as you can see, there are four main muscles immediately around the ball and socket joint. And these are called your rotator cuff muscles. And these do the main actions of, of uh, moving your shoulder joint about. But if you look at this lower the picture lower down, there are a lot of other muscles that connect to the shoulder blade. There are actually 17 muscles that uh, connect to the shoulder blade. Some are large and superficial, some are small and, and, and deep. In, but everything needs to be working together in sync for you to be having a good function. The minute, you know, sometimes you uh, there's muscle imbalance or injury, everything will get thrown out of whack and you can start suffering from shoulder pains and problems. Now, the last group of structures are the are soft tissue structures like the ligaments, you know, which connect the ball to the socket, the capsule, which is like another connection that covers the whole uh, ball and socket joint, and finally the labrum, which is a very important structure. It deepens the socket of the, of the, the scapula, okay, and we'll come to that again later. So these are the common shoulder conditions uh, that I'm going to discuss today. Now, this list is by mo no means uh, exhaustive, and um, there are also exceptions. Please bear in mind, you know, I have definitely treated people in their 20s with rotator cuff tears, just like I've treated uh, people in their 40s and 50s with labral tears. But generally, uh, this is the rough rule of thumb uh, when you see the conditions and, their, and the populations that they tend to uh, affect. Okay. So first, we'll start with problems affecting the youth. And these tend to be problems uh, affecting the labrum. Okay? Now, I mentioned the shoulder is a ball and socket joint. Okay? It's very much like a golf ball sitting on a tee. So you can see the size of the golf ball diameter is like three times that of the tee, the surface area of the tee. So what actually holds it in place is the socket. right? And uh, you have the labrum, which is a ring-like structure around that socket to help hold that ball in place. Sometimes if you get a tear, when the ball pushes against the labrum, it tends to either cause pain or it can even jump off that socket. So the, the labrum can tear in the front, it can tear in the back, or it can tear in the front, oh, sorry, at the top. And sometimes this tear can just progress. You know, it'll be a one quarter tear, 180 degree tear, a 270 degree tear, or even a full circle 360 degree tear. So generally, the tears in the front are most common, about 75% form tears in the front. And what do patients complain of? You know, sometimes they complain of dislocations, the shoulder popping out. Sometimes it doesn't pop out all the way, but they feel that it's unstable or pain when they go into a certain position. Okay? You see here, it's pain in the front of the shoulder on able position. So this is the able position when your arm is abducted and externally rotated. Okay? Generally, if you have one dislocation, uh, we would def definitely start a trial of physiotherapy first. But once you've had two dislocations, there is uh, a pretty strong indication for surgery because you don't know when the next time your dislocation is going to happen. You don't want it to be while you're swimming or, or driving and reaching the back seat or climbing a ladder at height. And sometimes you know, even some high demand people, uh, athletes or people who, who, who have mechanical uh, manual jobs, uh, you would get a uh, surgery done even for just one dislocation. So, how does it occur? Generally, you get an injury to the shoulder while your shoulder is in this able position. You either have a fall or there's a weight or someone drop on it and then you may get a tear of the labrum. Some people don't even have an injury, they just have generalized loose ligaments and that also can lead to the shoulder joint popping in and out. What are the investigations that the doctor may have ordered? Well, x-rays are very good at looking at the bones. So you would only be able to see, like in this x-ray, is the bone, are the, is the ball in the socket or is it out? Or have there been any fractures as it's been popping in and out? Okay. Generally, to see if your labrum was torn or not, one would get an MRI and that would see the soft tissues in the shoulder, the muscles, and this is the labrum 10 that you would see. So what's the treatment for these labral tears? The first step is usually always physiotherapy. You want to make sure that you maintain your function. And the idea is also to strengthen the muscles around the shoulder. 
So even though your socket is torn and can't hold the ball, primar uh, ball primarily in place, if you try to strengthen the muscles around the shoulder, maybe they can help to kind of keep it centered on the socket. And when that fails, uh, the then option would be do keyhole surgery to repair the tear. Okay. It sounds scary, but it's actually not that very easy. It's very minimally invasive these days. You have like two holes, for one for the camera, one for the, the portal where we do the, the repair. So that's the tear you see, and then we'll just stitch the tear back. Okay. So this is what it's like in real life, just two little holes. And then we would, this is the labrum that's torn off the bone and we stitch it in with sutures. It's no metal, there's no screws, nothing on x-rays or it's gonna set off the alarm when you're in the airport. And uh, patients recover very fast by this. And uh, usually you can get back to sports by three months, uh, provided your sport is not something contact like rugby and judo. So, then we hear about the terms like slap tears and posterior labral tears. So these are just variants of labrum tears. Slap stands for superior labrum from anterior to posterior, which just means the top part of the labrum from front to back. And um, who tend to get it? it, it generally, we people get a lot, do a lot of overhead activities like racket sports or throwing athletes, uh, javelin, gymnasts, weightlifting. But uh, if you would have just a fall and an outstretched arm or like a wrenching injury, like say you're on a bus and it jerks and there's a twisting, you could also get labral tears just from that as well. The symptoms you tend to complain about, it wouldn't be instability and popping, but you might feel like a big, deep pain, a clicking. That's quite a common complaint that we have. And uh, generally you have easy fatigue or decreased performance. Posterior labral tear is similarly just a labrum tear at the back of the shoulder. And this happens when some force has driven your arm to the back and torn the back of the shoulder, the labrum. And generally, it, can, it happens with people who do a lot of contact sports and do a lot of heavy lifting. But, you know, it can follow trauma and force as well. And similarly, they too would feel pain, especially at the back of the shoulder, you can pain of clicking. So like uh, the tears of the front, the, your doctor would uh, examine you the same way, do the investigations like x-ray and MRI. And we'll always start with physio first and see if we can get you back to function. And uh, if conservative measures fails, then keyhole surgery might be the uh, solution for you as well. Okay, so now we move on to the problems affecting the middle-aged. Okay, and uh, these tends to be problems uh, of the rotator cuff. Okay, which are the four muscles around the shoulder. So first up, what's, we're going, uh, going to tackle impingement. What is impingement? Now, it's a condition where your rotator cuff muscle tendon gets pinched between the bone of the humerus, the arm, and the acromion scapula. You can see this model here. This is the rotator cuff tendon. As you are moving your shoulder, especially for reaching overheads or far in front of you, it gets pinched between the bone below and above. Okay. Now, why does that occur? Well, a few reasons. Sometimes the tendon itself gets a bit thicker and swollen because of wear and tear and, 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 and use and just aging. Okay? Sometimes the bone either above or below develop bony spurs. And so those bony spurs kind of squeeze on the tendon in between them. And one final cause is you, oops, sorry, is you see the bursa. This bursa is a cushion that exists normally to allow smooth gliding of the tendon between the bone above and below. Sometimes this bursa can get inflamed and swollen and also pinch on this tendon as you're trying to reach uh, for things over the head or in front of you. The um, important thing to know is that this impingement uh, is, is really part of a spectrum. Okay? We call it rotator cuff syndrome. Okay, you can have just this pinching of the tendon that goes on when you're raising your arm. But sometimes as there's more rubbing, rubbing and friction, you can get a partial thickness tear of this tendon, okay? Sometimes these partial thickness tears can become full thickness tears. And if you had a very large full thickness tear, it can potentially progress and you get massive rotator cuff tears. And once you have massive rotator cuff tears, the rotator cuff is what helps hold your ball within the socket. Once it's gone, you can see like in this x-ray, the ball floats out of the socket and it's just normally just rolling about and giving rise to arthritis. 
Now, it doesn't mean that if you have impingement, you're going to go and have arthritis. It doesn't mean that you start at one spot and it progresses. It's just different points of a, on the spectrum. So generally, this impingement and rotator cuff tendonitis is the commonest cause uh, of shoulder pain. It accounts for more than half of the uh, shoulder pain presentations that we see specialists. Usually, you have a gradual onset pain. It's worse at night and worse whenever you do overhead activity, reaching out. And you know, a lot of patients complain how they can't reach behind the back. So their movement is affected, their strength is also affected. So let's say we do an x-ray. What are you going to find? Most of the time, the x-ray is going to be normal because the problem is not of your bone or your joint. The problem is the tendon. Okay? Sometimes your x-ray might show something strange and that would be, I guess, in extreme cases like when you have arthritis because of the radial cuff is already torn or if you see things like the spurs, the, those bony projections on the roof or uh, on the humerus side, and that's, what caught, that's what's causing the pinching of the bone. So sometimes you can see those on x-rays as well. But if the doctor really wanted to see the tendon and what's going on in the tendon, he'd either do an ultrasound of the shoulder or an MRI scan of the shoulder, okay, which is uh, far more uh, sensitive and, and, and shows a lot more information. So how do we manage impingement and rotator cuff syndrome? Well, first, we start with medications. Now, people always think it's painkillers. Painkillers are bad. I, you know, we don't become an addict. But actually, there, there's, it's more than just relieving the pain. They also have an anti-inflammatory process. A lot of this pain you feel is from, and the swelling is a result of inflammation. So they help to bring down the inflammation and can use either oral painkillers or uh, topical painkillers where either creams or plasters also help the same effect around the region without having uh, you know, side effects to the rest of the body. Now, physiotherapy is very important. I, I believe anyone who wants to get better fast and avoid surgery should invest in some good physiotherapy because that's how you make sure you don't lose the function you have and improve your function and strengthen your overall shoulder muscles. Sometimes people have very bad pain and that's what's stopping them from um, having a good sleep or having uh, doing their physiotherapy exercises. So that's when an injection, we call it a subacromial injection or a PHNL, uh, can help. This injection has pain, it has painkillers as well as steroids for the anti-inflammatory effect. Now there are minor risks associated with the procedure, uh, but generally they're quite safe. Acupuncture is another possible uh, pain adjunctive one that, that we use in our armamentarium when uh, treating shoulder pain. Uh, but you know it may not necessarily uh, help with the motion. Okay. And uh, finally, if everything else is, you tried everything and it's failed, there is a, the option of keyhole surgery again, uh, where we would uh, try to use a camera and then go in and remove any offending spurs or, or swollen inflamed bursa that might be. Okay? But generally, if there's no structural damage, I would avoid surgery if possible. Now, what happens when you get a rotator cuff tear? Okay, so with a rotator cuff tear, there are two types. You have your acute tear that just happened when you had a trauma or injury, like you, know, you fell off a ladder or you know, there was a jerk on the bus and you, and you twisted your shoulder. Or it could be a chronic kind of tear. Now, chronic tear is, is basically a tear that occurred from degeneration, wear and tear. You know, your, your muscle was just getting inflamed and, and it just gave up you know, one day over, over time. So the presentation for rotator cuff tears is very similar. You, you'd have shoulder pain, but you'd have weakness and you wouldn't be able to raise your shoulder in certain directions. So you can see a picture here. This lady here, you know, she can raise her left arm well, but you can, she can see her right arm doesn't go forward, but her rotation is, is fairly symmetrical. And uh, if you look at the tears, you could have small tears, medium-sized tears, large tears. So, the management of shoulder problems are generally very similar. You know, we always start with conservative first, the same medications we talk about. We could give that steroid injection if the symptoms are very severe, and we start with physiotherapy. And if all of that were to fail, uh, or if your condition uh, had you had a serious uh, injury, 
then the option of surgery comes into play. Okay. Now there are many surgery surgical options for bitter cup tears, and I do not want to muddle your mind with the, all the different ones out there. You know, you can range from simple just uh, repairing of the torn tendons to transferring tendons to replacing your whole joint to complex reconstructions or doing a salvage procedures. Generally, if you're seeing a shoulder specialist, he'd be able to advise you on which one is best for you and uh, he'd be able to perform the procedure competently. The, it tends to uh, depend on how bad is your injury, how large is the tear, how many muscles are torn, are your muscles still a viable muscle or they turn to fat on you. So there, there are a lot to think about. But by and large, the most common procedure done is the rotator cuff repair. And this is the keyhole surgery where you just repair the torn tendon through a few keyholes, you know, one for the camera, one for the instruments. Here's the muscle that's torn off the bone and we, we stitch it down back to the bone, secure in place with these plastic anchors. Again, there's no metal, there's no screws. Uh, and then we start the physio, and uh, generally it's got very good uh, reliable outcomes. Most patients uh, you know, are pain-free and very functional by about three to six months after the surgery. Now, another very common condition in the middle-aged groups is frozen shoulder, you know, and uh, patients always ask, doc, doc, do I have a frozen shoulder? So what is a frozen shoulder? It's a painful condition where your shoulder joint becomes stiff, okay? It's also known as adhesive capsulitis, okay? Capsulitis because the problem is that the capsule around the shoulder, you see this is a normal, healthy uh, capsule, becomes very thickened and inflamed and scarred, and then your, your movement is stuck because of that. Now, who tend to get it, okay? Fortunately, it tends to be the females in their 50s, around menopause, and um, people with diabetes or hormone problems like thyroid conditions, to have a high uh, incidence of this injury, not injury condition rather. That's it. There is a separate group of people that following a shoulder injury, it could be a gym injury, skiing injury, whatever, a fall, uh, they, they have pain in their shoulder and then they don't move their shoulder so much. These people can develop a secondary frozen shoulders. So that's why you can sometimes see frozen shoulders in 20 year old males or, or, or younger people out of the this usual population, okay? Now there's stages of the frozen shoulder. First stage is the freezing stage where it's getting pain, it's painful and it's getting stiff. The second stage is the frozen stage where it's not so pain anymore, but your shoulder is kind of stuck. And then you have the thawing phase where you know it starts melting and then the movement slowly coming back. But usually there's some pain at this point. So patients who sometimes worry, you know, I had pain, then I had no pain. And now I've got pain again, has something gone wrong? But actually, that's just the natural history of how this disease processes, uh, progresses. Okay, and as you can see, this is how long each stage kind of lasts. So, you know, it can take as long as a year and a half, two years for your condition to completely resolve. So the presentation, again, the patients have a lot of pain, especially at night, and stiffness. And it's usually a global restriction in range of movement. What I mean? is in all directions usually are very stiff. As a, and uh, let's say, even if the, uh, the patient wouldn't be able to raise the shoulder, the doctor wouldn't be able to move the shoulder either because it's just stuck. I mean, if you contrast this with a rotator cuff tear, it's usually just the torn tendon that, move, that motion is affected. And even if the patient couldn't uh, move the shoulder, the doctor could still move the shoulder because uh, there's the joints not stuck. So that's how we kind of differentiate between the two. So what's the management of frozen shoulder? Number one is reassurance. One thing you tell the patients, you know, you'll 100% get better, you'll always get better. The only downside is, you know, it could take about a year and a half, two. And there's always a chance that it might come back again, either to the same side or the opposite side in the future. We will treat their pain and give them anti-inflammatories. And we start them on aggressive physiotherapy so that they can try and loosen up the joint. Uh, Similarly, the steroid injection can also help with the pain and inflammation. Now, most patients, when you tell them, or at least when I tell them, look, it's gonna 100% go away, they're very happy and they leave it at that. But for some people, the, uh, the, the stiffness can be so disabling uh, that you know, they're stuck and just like 
30 degrees, 40 degrees, and they, and they get very hard to dress or to, get, or to go to work and do stuff. So they, they want a, a quicker uh, solution to the problem. Surgery is a, an option. And that's a keyhole surgery where you uh, put in a camera and then release the capsule. Okay? So here's an, here's an example of what a normal shoulder looks like if you're going from the inside. And in a frozen shoulder, all the structures, the, the muscles, the, the capsule, all thicken, injected, and red. And so we just release this during the surgery. And uh, this will just uh, give, give rise to a quicker recovery. And uh, most patients will uh, regain their motion within you know, four to six weeks or so. You can see it's not just the, 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 the middle-aged ladies. So sometimes younger men from gym injuries or sports injuries also develop a frozen shoulder. And then it becomes very hard, you know, with work and with your kids. And, and so they, they actually undergo a procedure. But if, if otherwise, if you're a patient, you can just wait it out and you will also recover. Now, here's another alternative to have, uh, having surgery, something called a distension arthrogram. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a procedure per se. It's, it's a special type of injection that we've done by a radiologist. So you can see here, there's an injection going to the shoulder joint and that's the dye. And it's, and it's not really moving about anywhere because the capsule is so tight. So what then happens is they will inject steroids and painkillers, make sure you're comfortable, and then slowly inflate that capsule up with fluid until the fluid capsule bursts. And then you can see now the dye goes everywhere. So this is kind of like doing a surgery without surgery where you're releasing the capsule. It, it does uh, give you pain relief and a slightly faster uh, recovery of motion, though, though not as good as uh, surgery, but at least you're avoiding the, uh, the risk of uh, anesthesia and surgery. So this dissension arthrogram is also another um, treatment modality one could consider. So finally then we come to elderly and joint problems. Now by and large, I guess the common shoulder problem in the elderly is probably degenerate cup tears, where the uh, rotator cuff you know, just gives way over time or, or with trivial falls and injury. Okay? Yeah, we're going to talk about joint problems now. Now, what's cuff tear arthritis? Now, that is shoulder arthritis in the setting of rotator cuff disease. Okay? Now, what patients tend to present with is pain. They feel this crepitus, uh, cracking sound when they move their shoulder. They can't raise their, their arms. They have a lot of wasting of the muscle. They get it thinner compared to the other side, and the swelling. If you do an x-ray, you'll see like this, you know, the ball is moved out of its socket, it's rubbing abnormally across all the surfaces and that's caused by pain. And um, if, if you wanted to look at the rotator cuff, like before you do another an ultrasound or an MRI scan, and you can see the cuff tear that they would have. As you can see, management is, 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 is almost universal for all the shoulder conditions we have. We start them on medi uh, medications. We can give them an injection if the pain is very severe. Let me suggest activity modifications. What does that mean? I mean, obviously, if you, if you have difficulty raising your arms, you need to avoid that or get in your mindset that you have to maybe just stick to just uh, playing mahjong and cooking now and, and, and not doing uh, more um, far-fetched stuff. Okay? And physiotherapy can help to maintain your function uh, as well and strengthen the whatever remnant muscles are left to kind of uh, hold on to your function. If all that fails, then again, there's surgery that can help with uh, this problem. Okay? So usually our indications for surgery is when you have failure of conservative management and the pain is worsening and you're losing your movement and you just can't perform your activities of daily living or whatever um, uh, tasks or, or hobbies that you would have liked to have done. Okay? And the surgery for, for cuff tear arthritis is a reverse total shoulder replacement. Now, what is a reverse total shoulder replacement? I remember we, you learned about the shoulder as a ball and a socket, right? So in a reverse total shoulder replacement, the ball is now switched to the shoulder blade side and the socket is now on the arm. Now, I'm sure you look at this x-ray here and you're like, my gosh, that's a lot of metal. That's scary. But actually, this component here, oops, this component here is this component here. And actually, it's, it's just the size of a 50 cent coin. This whole bit here is just about eight centimeters. Uh, and the reason why it looks so big is 
this patient here is uh, only weighs uh, 39 kilos. She's a small little frail lady, but uh, she was having severe shoulder pain. And when she had this replacement, uh, it brought about reliable pain relief and she could get overhead function as well. So, I mean, it may not be perfect compared to the other side, but it's much better than that initial, you know, like almost paralyzed state where they were, where they couldn't raise their arms. Now, primary shoulder arthritis is arthritis that occurs without any muscle or tendon tears. It uh, presents very similar to the, the cuff tear arthritis, you know, the pain, the decreased range of movement. Uh, the only difference is that, you know, as you can see here, the ball is still in, in touch with the, in the socket uh, the, because the muscles are intact. They just have your typical x-ray findings of arthritis of your bone spurs. You can see this is a, a CT scan that shows a lot of cysts or holes in the bone. There's no space between the ball and the socket. And you've got free uh, you know, spurs and, 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 and bony um, growth just floating around. So these are the classical kind of x-ray findings in arthritis that causes the pain. Okay, so for similar to the, to the uh, cuff tear arthritis, we try conservative management first, and that fails, then we can do a normal total shoulder replacement. Now, in a normal total shoulder replacement, the ball and socket is, is still on the, on the same corresponding sides. You know, the caveat being that the muscles must be intact for this to work. And uh, following a procedure like this, you know, like, you know, you, sorry, you can go on to get good function and return to sports, like uh, swimming and tennis and golf. So my patients was back to golf uh, somewhere between three to six months after his uh, replacement. And uh, you know, nowadays the technology, the implants are getting uh, even smaller and uh, you know, there's, it's less invasive. So you can be, you know, you can be in and out in a day and uh, have very good uh, functional outcomes. So now this is the part that I guess you've all been really waiting for and uh, what you want to take home. You want to avoid all these joint replacements and injuries. So how can I protect my shoulder from injury? Okay, so there are a few simple steps. Uh, I'm just going to run through them with you. Okay, number one, you know, it's, it's ergonomics and it's posture, workplace setup. You want to sit correctly. Looking at this picture, see, and when you're sitting at the desk, a lot of us, are, you know, spend a lot of time at the desk. And you make sure, you know, your feet flat on the floor, thighs are parallel, your lower back well supported, your shoulders are relaxed. How do you get your shoulders relaxed? Make sure your elbows are supported and that they're at the same level as your desk, okay? And then make sure that your computer screen is usually at level of your eyes, okay? And that everything is within an arm's reach ahead of you. You don't want to be constantly reaching your head and reaching your head and then, you know, just stressing out your rotator cuff tendons by always reaching, okay? Rearrange your workspace as well. Uh, make sure everything is kind of within the arm length and try to avoid unnecessary overhead reaching if you can. Now, if you use the phone a lot, you probably want to consider getting a headset so that way you don't, you're not always, you know, tilting your head to the side or have your uh, hand up to your ears or worse, just have your phones, you know, uh, tucked between your, your, your ear and your shoulder and that can give rise to neck pain. Now, change things up. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you're always going to be spending hours on the desk and you're always using your right hand, you know, there's a lot of stress for the mouse. Uh, perhaps you should change it up, you know, maybe you put your mouse on the left side once in a while, you know, you can train to be ambidextrous and, and kind of relieve the stress off uh, your shoulder signs. Take regular breaks. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, have a Kit Kat. No, what I mean is, um, you know, sitting down, concentrating at the, at, the, at the desk for long periods can give you a lot of tension in your neck and your shoulders. So it's recommended, you know, every like 30 minutes or so, just, you know, take a 10 second, 20 second break, you know, just stand up, look out the window and, uh, you know, loosen up your shoulders and then carry on. Every 30 minutes or so, I think taking a 10, 20 second break would be good for you, all right? And, and finally, ask for help. That's very important. There's uh, no place for pride uh, or ego, you know, if, if you're having some shoulder condition and you're, or pain and you're supposed to be carrying heavy stuff at work or files and stuff, ask help from your colleagues because you don't want to aggravate the condition that you might potentially have and make it worse. Next step is the activity modifications around the house. Okay, for example, even things like cooking and ironing can put stress on your shoulder. 
me explain how. Ideally, when you're cooking, you want to make sure that your, your arms are tucked in like this and everything is a head in front of you. If you're always having to, you know, crank your arm up and internally rotate and, you know, stir the pot or, or do sweeping motions like that, you're putting a lot of stress on your rotator cuff. Sometimes this can happen because your stove is too high, and then you end up having to do that. So that's the case. You might want to get a stool or something such that you can be positioned with your shoulders down, okay? And as you can see in this position here, this photo here, this is bad. You don't want to be trying to multitask one hand, doing the stirring one hand, holding the baby, then some third miraculous hand holding the phone and doing other stuff. So try and keep things uh, civil, you know, when you're, when you're doing your cooking. So similarly, ironing, this, if the board is too high, you're always going to be in this position and uh, you're going to be jamming that rotator cuff in your, the roof of the, of the shoulder blade. So like in this picture down here, everything is nice and, and low and tucked in and you can get the job done well. Hanging clothes can put a lot of stress on the uh, shoulder as well, especially, you know, previous, oops, previously when you had to use these poles, there's a lot of force holding these poles and, and hooking it outside your, your window, at least with, um, with uh, this newer kind, you can rest it on, the, on, the, on that slab and then just uh, slot it back in. So there's less force on your shoulder trying to, to carry this whole stick and the weight out. Okay? The best would be if you have one of these uh, kind of uh, hanging poles installed because you can lower it down and you can hang on the clothes uh, low without having to reach up and hang over and then you can just raise it up. To them. And then think about the tire. You know, the, lot of the commonest thing with uh, people with shoulder planes complain about is that they can't reach behind. So things like a bra might be a problem. So you might want to get a front clasping bras instead. Or what some patients do is they hook in the front and pop it around. And uh, if you're having shoulder problems, probably not the time to be wearing your super tight fitting clothes and maybe you wear more sleeveless stuff or things with buttons and zips and easier to get in and out of. Okay, warming up, that's important, okay, because exercising cold muscles is a no-no, okay. So by warming up the shoulder joint before you do your active exercises, uh, you know, you, what happens is, you know, this fluid in the joint, we call it the synovial fluid, helps to lubricate the joint, okay. It also stretches it out a bit, improves, improves the range of movement, and it prevents further injury from occurring, okay. So these are a lot of uh, simple stretches that you can do before you start doing your, your, your sports and your exercises, okay? Just moving across. This is a simple pendulum kind of uh, stretching where you drop your arm forward, backwards, side to side in circles. Okay, this is a cross shoulder stretch where you're stretching the capsule. If you have a door frame, you can put your arm and swing your body, turn your body out and in. That stretches the rotators. And then you can also put your arm on your door frame on the top and at the side and lean out, slowly lean out to stretch your shoulder joint as well. Okay, here the shoulder rotation exercises you can do. You pull it up, hold and squeeze, pull it back, hold and squeeze, and pull it down, hold and squeeze. And then for rotation, you can also get a, either a broomstick or an umbrella, a towel, and then, you know, push it out one way and then the, repeat for the opposite side and then around the back, pull it out one way and then repeat for the opposite side. And this is called a sleeper stretch. So while you're sleeping, have your shoulder and elbow bent at 90 degrees, and then you stretch it down well, one way and the other way for external rotation. So these are some warm up stretches you can do. Okay. Then the next part is to strengthen the shoulder muscles. And it's not just the rotator cuff muscles, but the muscles all around the shoulder blade. Now, before you do these strengthening exercises, Please note, I mean, proper form is paramount. It's not about how heavy you lift, but it's making sure your, your form is correct, okay? And slowly build up your endurance, meaning don't go from zero to hero straight away. You start with the light weights first, and before you build up the heavier, heavier weights. And lastly, uh, never underestimate the, the importance of cross-training. What I mean is, let's say if you're always swimming, um, you know, you're always doing a certain kind of action to your, your shoulder, and, uh, you know, that can aggravate an injury. So sometimes it's good to mix it up, you know, also do some cycling, also do some running. You're still getting your exercise, you're still getting activity uh, without uh, aggravating and doing some repetitive action that can, um, that can further injure your shoulder. 
Okay, so shoulder strengthening exercises, I mean, like I said, we need to strengthen the rotator cuff muscles and we also need to strengthen the um, uh, muscles around the shoulder blade, okay? So here are some exercises that you can do with a resistant band. And you can buy these resistant bands from Lazada or Shopee uh, quite cheaply, okay? And they'll deliver now during a circuit breaker to our decathlon. So here are some examples. Um, you can see standing on the band, you can pull it forward, this is for the flexion. You can adjust it, uh, tight your door frame, pull it backwards, this is for the extension. Standing on it, you can also practice swinging outwards. This is for abduction, tying it to a door and pulling it inwards. And also tying the door with your shoulder away and swing out. And then with your shoulder near to the door, pull in. And then you repeat it for the opposite sides. So these exercises will strengthen your rotator cuff muscles. Next, you want to strengthen the muscles around your, your, your rotator cuff and the shoulder. So these are some exercises you could do. You could pull your shoulders up. These pull it forward and pull it upwards. These exercises are for the deltoid muscle around the shoulder. And then tying it to the door, you can pull it forward and then shrug your shoulders. These will strengthen all the muscles around your shoulder blades in the back. And finally, I think some of you will be familiar with this. You've got seated rows, uh, bent over rows and natural pull down rows. So these will help build the big muscle in your back, the lat that they help stabilize your shoulder blade. And uh, these two exercises, where you're pulling your arms out and squeezing the muscles in between, you know, exercise the, uh, the central muscles in between your shoulder blades as well. Final thing is to rest, actually. So make adjustments to your workouts and to your lifestyle. If you're in your routine, if you're having shoulder pains, you don't want to just aggravate it further, okay? Everyone knows what rice stands for, you know, rest, Ice, compression, and elevation. P, the price is uh, protect. So you've got to protect that joint. Um, if you're having some pain, don't, don't aggravate it uh, any further. Just uh, change your activity, do something else first. Okay? Uh, sleeping position. You know, uh, obviously, when you're in, in a lot of pain or have a shoulder injury, you don't want to be lying on that shoulder. It's, it's recommended that you sleep flat on your back. And uh, sometimes that can still be uncomfortable. So what you could do is put a pillow just under the joint and uh, that could help um, uh, with the pain and, and swelling. And finally, listen to your body. What I mean by that is, uh, you know, not at the first instant of pain, don't go running to a shoulder specialist and say, Doc, I've got, I woke up with pain. Uh, I think it's okay to you know, self-medicate with some anti-inflammatories, uh, change your routine a bit and uh, observe it for a while. But let's say if you're still having pain, you know, a week later, two weeks later, um, and uh, you probably want to get it checked out because you might be having an injury that you don't want to aggravate further uh, by, by negligent, uh, negligence. So, uh, come to the end of the talk. So, just to summarize so, accurate diagnosis and evaluation of the different conditions will inevitably lead to you know, appropriate treatment by initiation and better outcomes. So, it's, uh, it's good that you get it properly checked out. Uh, you've learned a bit about the anatomy of the shoulder and you've learned about how there's a bit of a age-related distribution to the different conditions that can occur. Uh, in the young, it tends to be a problem with the labrum, okay? Uh, and we know that, learn that, you know, anterior labral tears can be used for instability, and generally two dislocations or more is an indication for surgery. And um, let's say if you're always having persistent pain during gymming or you're clicking or problems with overhead uh, activities, Maybe you might be having a, another form of labral tear, like a slack, posterior labral tear. In the middle age, it usually tends to be a cut problem. Okay? Impingement is the commonest cause. You know, two thirds of people of the shoulder pains we see probably there. Generally, it should resolve with uh, conservative treatment like you know, physio and rest and anti-inflammation. But uh, if, it's, if it's going on longer than that, or if it's severely affecting your function, please see a doctor early. With rotator cuff tears, I guess the important take home is that those acute rotator cuff tears from an injury or so in an active patient should be seen early. Okay. Frozen shoulders, you learn, okay, when you get a frozen shoulder, it's not just about the pain, it's about the global stiffness that affects all the range of movement. Now these generally get better on its own, but it can take one and a half years to two years. So if you're patient, then that's great. 
If not, you might need to do something further, uh, be it a steroid injection or the distension arthrogram or, or chemo surgery. And uh, in the elderly uh, with joint problems, you know, initial conservative treatment is always acceptable. It's always suggested. I mean, the decision for surgery is ultimately based on the patient's activity level. You know, what's their expectations, what their demands? Are they still going on holidays and, and, and active? And, and whether they have a lot of existing medical problems and whether they're able to follow post-op physiotherapy protocols. Okay, so uh, thanks for listening to the talk. Um, once again, uh, we're part of the shoulder and elbow orthopedic group. We've got uh, three branches, uh, one in Fair Park, that's where I'm based. There's got one in Mount E Novena and uh, one in Glen Eagles as well. All right, man, great. Thanks a lot. You know, you have a great week ahead, week, great weekend ahead, huh, Ruben. Yeah, you nice too. to see you, man. All right. Hope sure. to see you in person one day, man. Yeah. All right. Take good care. Take care.